Thank you for tuning in to Ocean Rays Podcast. And now, your host, the godfather of sustainability, celebrity chef Rick Moonen. What a beautiful day, everyone. Thank you so much for listening. Um, I'm uh, interviewing from my studio. This is Chef Rick Moonen here in Las Vegas. Uh, This is where we get to dive into deep conversations with uh, some of the original gangsters of cuisine. The name of the podcast is Ocean Raised. Um, We're all globally connected by the oceans of the world and the food cultures that it shares. Uh, Today, (laughs) we're going to go deep. This is super deep. You know, I I get to speak with um, a gentleman that is an an icon in the the culinary world. Uh, He has influenced thousands upon thousands of uh, cuisiniers, cooks, and chefs throughout his career. His uh, name is Jacques Pepin. He was born uh, in France in uh, an area called Bourg-en-Bresse. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, Chef. It's ne- yep. near Lyon in France, where uh, the, the cuisine of Lyon is, is, is one of the best in the entire world. It's a beautiful place. Jacques was the second of, two, of three sons uh, and, uh, in France, and then he, he came to America and became uh, the American icon that he is. So he's totally a French-born American chef. Uh, he's right. also an amazing right. author. A culinary educator, TV personality, and an amazing artist. You see behind me, I have some of his artwork uh, that I am displaying today. Um, he's authored over uh, 30, 30 cookbooks. I don't know where you found the time, uh, Chef, but it's, they're all amazing. Uh, many of them became bestsellers. Uh, the, the one over to my right, right here, La Technique. This book, when I went to the Culinary Institute of America in 1976, uh, that's when this book came out. And this is the first book that I purchased. He was a big deal to me. I didn't have any money, you know. And this book, had, it was his photographs after photographs of how to actually fillet a fish, how to break down a chicken, the basics, but the techniques. And it's not a recipe. It's much, much more than a recipe because it, it told you how to do something. So now you can take that same technique. If you can break down a chicken, you can break down a squab. You can break down a woodcock. You can break down any bird because they're, they're basically the same. Um, Jacques Pepin is lifelong friends with um, amazing people like Pierre Frenet, Julia Child, I'm sure you've, <laughs> and, and James Beard. He's won uh, Emmy Awards. There's hardly any awards that uh, Jacques Pepin has not. Uh, I don't. They'd have to start making up awards for him to get more than he has received. <laughs> Twenty-four James Beard Foundation awards, uh, five honorary doctoral uh, degrees. And uh, the, the Légion d'Honneur, which is uh, France's highest order of merit, which he received in 2004. Um, he's taught, he's, a, he's a, a dean, and he's taught at the uh, Boston University, um, and also at the, well, it was originally the French Culinary Institute years and years ago with Dorothy uh, Kahn Hamilton. It was yourself and Alain Sayac and Jacques Torres and André Soltner. And yeah. uh, it was, it was a, it's now morphed into the International uh, Culinary Center in which you still participate. I mean, you're, you're unbelievable. Um, and in 2016, uh, your son-in-law and your daughter and yourself collaborated to start the, the uh, Jacques Pepin Foundation, which yeah. is a, a culinary education for adults with barriers to employment. Basically, second chances, people that need a, a chance in life to, 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 to get a, 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 an, another opportunity to be employed. And what better yeah. way than through the arts of, uh, of cuisine and culinary uh, arts. Um, you worked at the Hotel Plaza Athene. I mean, also Daniel Ballou. A lot of chefs came in uh, into the United States through, the, through, that, through that portal in New York City. Um, in 1959, you were at La Pavillon. Um, in 1961, you uh, turned down a job uh, to uh, be the personal chef for uh, the the Kennedys, I believe, right? Joseph uh, Kennedy or, yeah. And uh, Jacqueline Kennedy. And you, you were, the, you were uh, but instead you decided to pair up with uh, Pierre Frenet and to uh, work with Howard Johnson's to help right. revolutionize um, that style of cuisine. And, and I, just, I just find that amazing. And your culinary career just kept going and you opened up your own restaurant in New York, uh, La, uh, La, Pota- La Potagerie. Now potage yeah. is a, uh, for those who don't know, it's, it's, it's a hearty soup. It's a soup. So yeah. you were the original soup Nazi, pretty much, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> but I mean, and, and that was amazing. But then, uh, unfortunately, um, 
I think it was 1974, you, you had a uh, car accident that, uh, but, nothing, yeah. but nothing slows yeah. you down, Chef. That, that's, oh, wow. that's just what blows my mind. At age 21, you're in the military. You get into the office of the treasury and you're uh, the personal chef to three heads of state, including, including Charles de Gaulle. And, and right. as, we, as we talk, I want to know what uh, Charles liked to eat. I mean, <laughs> um, amongst the books, you also did La Technique, La Method, and 28 plus month other books. You, uh, you're the dean of the French Culinary Institute, a columnist for the New York Times. You wrote books, you did shows. Basically, you're a mentor to everyone. You're an incredible <laughs> chef, artist, <I> that. <laughs> teacher, <laughs> husband, father, friend. I mean, I consider okay. all of these. And, you know, I am oh, yeah. loving, 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 loving your, um, your, um, your videos. They're, they're constantly coming out. Three, four-minute videos. I'm on my Facebook. I'm looking down. I oh, see you. Yeah, um, right. From anything from how to bake a potato to uh, making a, you know, chicken piccata. You know, it's, it's, it's just yeah. unbelievable. I love, love, loving that. And also... Um, was it the art of the craft I saw recently, which is a documentary on you. And I highly, oh. highly recommend anyone to, that has any interest whatsoever in, in cuisine to, uh, to, to, to yeah. follow your story, because I, I, I just touched on a few of the highlights of your career. There's uh, so many more. It would take up the entire hour that I want to speak with you. <laughs> yeah. So welcome, welcome, welcome. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. you thank you very much. I am doing great. I mean, you know, I, uh, I was in Florida. I came back from Florida at the beginning of March. Mm -hmm. And since the beginning of March, we've been home in Connecticut quarantine. But as you say, I've done about 150 uh, of those uh, few minutes recipe for Claudine. My daughter, she showed that on Facebook, PBS, American Master is using them, PBS too. So, uh, so I've been busy. Yeah. It's, it's never ending. You're the ever, you're the, you the ever ready battery bunny. You know, you just continue to <laughs> yeah, right, teach right. And, 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 and to paint, you know, I mean, you yeah. spend, you spend time in Florida. That's primarily the reason that you, uh, you go to a small Island. Basically, if you face West, I believe the Island of you, your right foot is in Georgia and your left foot is in Florida. It's, it's right. right there. Amelia Island. Yes. Yeah, right. It's, uh, but I mean, to try to avoid the winter a couple of months, uh, you know, January, February. But uh, I don't know whether we'll go next uh, uh, this winter with what's going on. But mm. anyway, we are fine at home. We celebrated last week our 54th anniversary. So uh, we've been together for a while. Congratulations, <laughs> Chef. That is absolutely so inspirational. Yeah. Um, now, I want to go in a couple of different directions. But something I'm curious about is, is, is music. Do you, do you enjoy listening with, to music? I know that you, you paint. Yes. You spend many hours painting. You've been in the right. kitchen. So where does, does music come into your life at all? If so, um, oh, yeah. a lot. What a are lot. your favorite artists? What do you like to listen to? Well, you know, for me, a lot of classical music, uh, all of the Chopin, Liszt, Brahms, and so forth, but also jazz. I mm. love jazz. And I love the classic, like uh, Ella Fitzgerald, Nat King Cole, all that type of uh, music, jazz, like uh, Dave Brubeck, whatever, mm -hmm. and, uh, and classical music. That basically, and of course, all kind of French songs from Edith Piaf to uh, uh, Gilbert Beco or Charles Davour, French singer that uh, I used to listen to when I was uh, younger <laughs> and living in France. So yeah, they are, I love music, yes. I remember uh, I was in the kitchen and uh, it was called L'Hostellerie Bassan with Jean Morel. And he, oh, would yeah. he would listen to music all the time. In the middle uh -huh. of service, he was so crazy about music. He would stop service when uh, Name That Tune came on. He would say, stop, stop. Everybody, uh, wait. And then you know, you'd get the three notes and he had, to, he had to guess the name of the song. Yeah. So Jean I, Morel, yes. Yeah, I remember him. <laughs> He's from my hometown. Is that right? Yeah, for book on bus, yes, right. Yeah, that's right, exactly. That's exactly right. He was, he was another character in my life. I mean, right. so much influence, you know, and uh, it's funny how, it, how it, it just sinks into you and becomes a part of your, 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 your internal fiber and, 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 and true. In, in your pathways in life. You're always referring back to the simplistic um, messages that you got. And, and probably the most and strongest message that I would get from you watching you would be that don't be afraid. You know, you, you and Julia Child, you know, cooking together on television really yeah. helped break down the barriers of, uh, of, 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 of 
the intimidation of the French uh, style of cuisine, you know, you, you basically showed people that hey, we can do this. This is not, this is not the end of the world, but the most important message that I got was start with something and you can always adjust. Yes, you see, there is a misunderstanding of French cooking because people, American, very often refer to French cooking because of the great chef in France, the three-star restaurant in the Michelin Guide. Well, there is about 20 three-star restaurants uh, in France, 20. There is about, uh, I don't know, 70 or, or 80 two-star and about 400 one-star. There are about five, 600 star restaurants, but only 23 star. And people tend to look at French cooking through those eyes. And this is extraordinary, very complicated, very uh, elegant cuisine. There is 148,000 restaurants in France. So 20, I have people in my family, even in France, who have never been in a three-star restaurant. But for many Americans, this is what French cooking is. I remember when I took people to France at Boston University, I used to take a group. And we go to Lille Bistro and all that too. And uh, they say, wow, I didn't know French cooking this way. They refer to more as Italian cooking, very simple type. And for me, I am from a family, I can count 12 restaurants in my family in France, 12 of them run by women. My mother, my aunt, my cousin, to all women. I'm the first male to go into that business. So the type of restaurant that they used to do, very simple, going to the market in the morning, doing your menu, my mother, is that type of very simple food that often Americans do not associate with French cooking. You know? Yeah, you know, we're, we're all human beings, but what you accomplished along with Julia is to tell everybody to calm down. It's just food. You know, we're sharing with each other. You often yeah, refer right. to, when you do recipes, you speak about Gloria, or your wife, you know? Right. And you're like, you know, I like it this way, but my wife likes it that way. So I like to be able to do a little bit of both, you know? And I experienced that because my wife is Ronnie. She's, uh, she's gluten-free. So, you know, by association, I also have to be gluten-free. I can't make a big bowl of pasta. <laughs> my wife will look at me cross-eyed and wonder what happened, you know. But, you know, I mean, you cook to please, you know. I mean, when you invite people under your roof, you know, it's to take care of them, to take care of their happiness when they are there. So, you know, what's the point of doing a dish that you love and if they don't like it? You know, you try to... Uh, to please people, and yeah. that's what cooking is all about, you know. And uh, more than ever now with the pandemic, people realize how important it is to get together, to mm -hmm. cook, to get to the garden, to get to the, you know, get the stuff. And not only the cooking, but of course the sitting down and the sharing of food with a bottle of wine, that's what life is all about, you know. And so, that's, that you do that, you know, for stranger as well as friend, and that a way of communicating with people, a way of bringing people together. You know, like we say, there is no, uh, you know, there, there is no color of skin in the eye of the stone. You know, no. you are in, in, the, in the kitchen, you work with anyone, but there is no political implication in what we do. There is no racial implication or gender implication or religious implication. Mm -hmm. You know, when you cook together, uh, you cook together, period, you know. From here, from the heart. That's truly, yeah. truly where it comes from. I, I wanted to, you are versed and knowledgeable of all areas of cuisine from my perspective. I mean, I don't think there's, you know, from game meat to, uh, to, to, to uh, the, 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 the usual meats that we eat in America, you know, from uh, beef, pork, chicken, you know, we, we're, we're pretty narrow. But you, you have a, a vast knowledge of, uh, of meat and, and as well as seafood. And... For me, and I, and I believe and I, I'm going to refer to something in a second, uh, I have gone through some evolutions. I've had to adjust my attitude towards uh, seafood in, in, in my career. For, I've been doing it for 45 years. So yeah. I'm, I'm still brand new compared to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but I remember aquaculture specifically being introduced to me and I was completely against it as no this, this is crazy right. and I understand that you know we farm clams and mussels and oysters and shrimp that was all okay but when it came to fish thin fish you know I was I was a little bit more hesitant I said well why can't we just you know take from the wild and then we can continuously go forward but as I started to learn more and more there's a uh, <laughs> 
we, we've overfished a lot of things, you know. And so now this is oh, what yeah. I'm going to refer to. You and I, there's an, an award back here somewhere that I, we got from the Seafood Choices Alliance. And you and I were the original two chefs that supported uh, Seafood Choices Alliance, which was uh, out of Washington, D.C., Vicki Spruill, um, and uh, it was started by SeaWeb. Right. And we were, we were speaking out years ago about uh, the cautions of uh, sustainability and, and the, 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 uh, the dangers of overfishing. And then as we learned subsequently beyond that time, we, um, I know for me, I started to learn more about aquaculture of uh, farm-raised Atlantic salmon. At that time, it was not being done in a manner that was very uh, sensitive to the environment. There was escapes. There was a lot of things that needed mm -hmm. to be learned. But all right. Adjustments were made, just like, you know, you start out with something and you adjust. And now today, over more than 50% of what we consume globally comes from aquaculture. So right. better aquaculture to me, and this is where my adjustment was made in my mind, companies that are doing it better need to be um, recognized, acknowledged, and, uh, and, and, and it would be, it's up to us to put it into our hands, to, to start playing with it, and to adjust as we go along. So what I wanted to ask you is, um, how is how, how, what is your opinion on the curve of seafood, the introduction of aquaculture, and the changes that happened during your career? Well, certainly, you know, there is a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of fish that uh, I love and which are difficult to get from uh, whiting to, uh, to, uh, <laughs> to uh, uh, you know, simple fish which are inexpensive, but mm -hmm. you cannot get it. But... Uh, it's interesting that you said, because a couple of years ago, I was in Copenhagen at mm -hmm. the NOMA. I was doing a, a thing there, and I spoke with the people from Norway, which were there, who bring uh, uh, Norwegian uh, salmon and stuff like this. And I said, there is not enough differentiation between fish which are grown into a tank somewhere and fed uh, whatever they fed them, mm -hmm. and this and other type of raising fish in the sea itself you know, where the fish are much larger to suit. But for many Americans, if it's, uh, 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 you know, raised fish, they don't know the difference between those quality, a certain quality too. I don't even myself. And it should be differentiated more between the quality of sustainable, uh, you know, aquaculture done in a proper way to other which are... Uh, uh, not done the proper way, you know, without any question. And it's still difficult to show that the market, you know, uh, you, you have a, a, you know, a raised fish, well, uh, of some quality, some it's $25 a pound, and another fish is $8 a pound. Why is that so different? You know, so. Well, supply and demand, I'm sure. But I mean, yes. now, now I think we're on the, the precipice of, hope, of, of more tra of transparency. Where, yes. you know, I've, I've seen historically in the, in the seafood industry, especially in aquaculture, um, they, they kept their doors closed. The information was not available. You, you didn't know it right. was in the feed. You didn't know the ratio of marine proteins that it took to make a pound of the final product. And, and it was, it was uh, not, a, not a good number, which is why they weren't really revealing a, a lot of this information. Now we're at a point, I think, where like Forever Oceans, who uh, sponsors this, uh, this podcast, this is a, this is a, a mentality in a company that's taking into consideration nutrition, flavor, texture, as well as sustainability. So I'm I'm extremely excited. So in 2021 to start oh, sure. uh, seeing some of the uh, the products such as amberjack, which is an amazing fish. Right? Oh yeah, it is an amazing fish. Yes, right. Yeah. And, uh, and I go ahead. I had some not too long ago. I mean, I had it both ways. I had it raw, sliced mm -hmm. very thin, and I had it just. Uh, broil lightly uh, both i mean it's it's an extraordinary fish yeah it's yeah. fatty it's delicious and in, in in previously fin fish besides salmon other fish that were coming through the aquaculture uh, system seemed kind of boring not really that exciting you know so now uh, amberjack to me is exciting um grouper you know another fish that's fantastic is also going to be raised uh, through the uh, forever ocean system and uh, when i say that system it's um it's a, a land-based uh, hatchery, and then they, they, they take the fish when they reach a certain maturity, when it's time for them to go into the ocean. They place them into these, uh, way out into the ocean. They put them in these pods that are robotically uh, controlled, 
you know, and the feed is, is very carefully selected so that the fish are very healthy. They're not over uh, populating the, the, the pod. So there's yeah, no that's stress. Good. So, that's when, good. so so they stay healthy and they stay so that they, we get what we want. And, and, and besides grouper, there's red snapper, there's many other species. So transparency so that you don't have to make apologies later. Or, or, or finally disclose the information, you know, and when you're, when you're, when you're put your back to the wall, this is a new, hopefully a new system and we can treat seafood in America uh, a little bit more respectfully. That is what I would hope. No, no question about it. This is the future. I mean, you know, a control quality fish. I mean, this is what we want uh, with affordable price. Well, why not? I mean, you know, I eat fish two, three times a week. You know, so uh, look at you. you look fantastic. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. I'm going to be 95 in uh, 10 years. So uh, okay. I, I look forward to speaking to you again in 10 years, Chef. That would be <laughs> okay. fantastic. <laughs> okay. Oh, All man. right. So, I mean, so it's exciting for me to have a, more of a transparency. But what I would like to see is, and this is, this is a pet peeve of mine. I go into a supermarket, just name any local supermarket that's of, of substantial size that has a, a seafood counter and, you know, a deli counter, a meat counter, a butchery, whatever. And uh, you, you walk up there and you can get a quarter pound of bologna, thin sliced, you know, and they take out of the display a beautiful sleeve, shrink wrapped in plastic wrap of a whole bologna, they put it on the slicer and they slice it. So you go to a seafood counter, there's not a knife to be seen. Nothing is being cut. They're just there. You get it the way it is. They don't know anything about it. I love to ask questions, but they don't know. This, to me, is what needs to change. We need to have someone with a knife so that the confidence that you put into the United States of America, along with Julia Child and, and, and some other characters at the time, breaking down the pretense. Well, seafood has that sort of pretense, you know, the French cuisine, Seafood. We're afraid of it in the United States. You don't yeah. smell a lot of seafood being cooked in, in most kitchens in the United States, unfortunately. And, this, and everyone knows that it's a healthy you know, thing for you, for your family. It's real quick and it's fast. But because I think of price and, and lack of knowledge, they don't know. So what I would like to see yeah, is that... I agree with you. I agree entirely with you because 30 years ago, here, right here in Connecticut, where I live, I used to go to New Haven. Mm -hmm. The fish were piled up in ice. And I would ask the guy, give me, no, no, give me this one. No, that one, this one, too. I shoot. The guy cut the fish. He said, you want it bone out? You want this? You want that? I used to do that in New York in a small store also on, the, on the Broadway near mm -hmm. Columbia University when I was there. And I remember going there and the guy would throw out like he, he bone out or cut some salt and he throwed out the row. I said, can I have the row? He said, well, why don't you? I said, yeah, my wife loved the row. Give me the row too. And when they bone out a fish, I said, can I have the bone? I needed to do a stock or don't cut it or I want it whole. And strangely enough, the cooking in America has changed incredibly in the last 20, 30, 40 years, 30, 20 years, for the better. Extraordinary cook. And, uh, but not for the fish. You're absolutely right. We used to have those stores where you have the whole fish, and now all of that has disappeared. And for some reason, it's starting a little bit now that people cook whole fish in a restaurant. But they are terrorized that the people are going to bite on a, on a bone and, uh, and sue the, the, the restaurant or whatever. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the point is that uh, <laughs> people should know that if you cook a fish uh, all together, a whole grouper, you know, in the oven and all that, much easier to do and absolutely delicious right mm -hmm. on the bone, you know. But uh, we do that less and less uh, when we should do it more and more, certainly, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're a little bit impatient. I think we have a long way to go still. But again, we're a young country. We're only a couple of hundred years old. You know? So right. you have castles in France that are more oh, yeah, older sure. than that. <laughs> yeah. you know. But that being said, I think that um, you know, it's exciting to be you know, alive in this industry, embedded in it, caring about it, connected with our environment, understanding that if our environment doesn't stay healthy, we're not going to get anything healthy out of there. Nothing good comes out of a bad situation like that. You know, right. so uh, we, hopefully in my, my 
rest of my tenure on this, on this beautiful planet, which I believe should be called planet ocean, not planet earth, because it's covered in three quarters in ocean. <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> but You're right. I hope to see a better um, connectedness between and, and, and a breaking down of the, 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 the things that intimidate people. So, for instance, if you could walk into a, a store and just say, you know, I, read, I, I saw uh, this recipe for uh, Mahi Mahi. But uh, what do you have in the store right now that might, might, might be uh, considered, you know, a good replacement or something else that you have that might be fresher or something? And you've got an actual answer, something that would, would instill the confidence in you that you asked a question that you're not getting chewed away like, uh, like the soup Nazi. Get out of here. You don't know. Yeah. You know, because, I mean, it was like going to the Fulton Fish Market. For me, that was intimidating, but I learned something every time. That's the way it should be at a fish, at a fish store or an exchange. So you agree? Yeah. I, I, uh, I go to the supermarket all the time, the best mm -hmm. that I can find, by, because for what I do, I want people to relate to the product that I buy, mm -hmm. uh, a regular supermarket. But my fish, I always get it in a store here in Guildford called Starfish Market. Mm -hmm. And I know the owner and his wife, and they get the fish. And if I want to order some whiting or stuff like that, I can order it. He will get them for me next week. So I always go to a fish store, I got to get my fish. I mean, when I have the, the fresh, uh, uh, you know, the soft shell crab, the thing, the, yeah. the, uh, uh, and the, the roe, certainly the, the roe in the spring that we get here. And uh, yeah, I, I like to go to the, to the fish store and look at the fish and get whatever I want there and the choice that he has, he had much more choice, of course, than the supermarket, you know, so yeah. Are you familiar? Do you know Rod Mitchell? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. From Brown Trading, yeah. He he um, he was pushed along by another chef who was a friend of mine when he was alive, Jean Louis. Yeah, Jean Louis Paradin. Yeah, Paradin, yeah. Uh, he, he he went up there and getting, he told getting him, getting the blanchaille, the real uh, blanchaille, you know, the 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 the, the tiny fish. Uh, what do you call uh, the uh, uh, bait fish? We call it. No, White. no, 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 the bait fish. Bait fish. I did that last week actually on my. Uh, on my uh, little Facebook thing, yeah. I went to the, to the sea because it's a, it's a right of summer for me. With my friend, with Annette, we follow the, the beach, you know, to turn around and get those white bait uh, we call blanchaille in France. Mm -hmm. We press on the belly, you know, to, to take a bit of the, the inside out, mm -hmm. dry it, uh, put them in milk and flour and deep fry them like French fries. Right. And this is uh, really, really good. But Jean-Louis Paradin, it's one of the first ones which introduced uh, uh, anguilas, you know, anguilas, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which is the tiny eel, tiny, which yeah. is like a little, a tiny little piece of spaghetti, you know, <laughs> with two black eyes, yeah. you know, and the, the anguilla, you blanch them and after with olive oil and garlic, it's absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. And Rod, Rod Mitchell would get it for him, you know, and that years ago. But well, you know, again, I remember in New York on, on 10th Avenue, a fish store that I used to go to, they used to have anguillas, uh, the, the, the little uh, eel like mm -hmm. that too. Now you can't find them, you know, unless, uh, so well, anyway. Talk about expensive. Was, that, that, was, that was an expensive uh, venture for yeah. anybody. And you, yeah, you cook them extremely quickly with a little bit of garlic and chili flakes. And oh, yeah, right, right, right. So whatever happened to Dover's Hole? Well, yes. I mean, whatever happened to Dover Soul, I, I, I get it. I get Dover Soul from, uh, from my fish market there. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's expensive, but I love Dover Soul. And when you, I mean, you can put them on the grill and uh, you turn them with a fork, like a steak and all that. Yeah. You cannot do that with a, with a flounder and all that. It's all apart. I mean, there is so many, but you know, though, whether it's uh, flounder or lemon sole or, or fluke, or any of those flat fish uh, I love, but the other soul is in a kind of quality on itself, you know, so, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited to um, finally sample uh, the, uh, the, the first products that come through the uh, Forever Oceans pipeline. And of course, I would love to you know, include you in, in, the, in the experimentation of these, of these uh, this new sustainably raised um, uh, aquaculture products that are be coming out. Are they going to a black cod now? Um, Sablefish, I believe it's in the it's in, it's on the on the list of things. There's, there's, yeah, there's, yeah. I mean, cobia. 
Yeah, it's, uh, it's so good. Yeah. yeah. To me, that's yeah. the veal of the ocean. There's so yeah. the, the texture of it and the yeah. and the versatility. You know, yeah. you can put whatever you want on there. It's just like open up your cupboard and you see what you have in there. Yeah. Can, as long as it's got some acidity, some salinity, and and you don't overcook yeah. the fish too badly, you're going to be in good shape. You know. Yeah. Uh -oh. So. What would you consider, okay, growing up, let's go way back, you know, um, you have two brothers and yourself. Who was the best cook in the family? Did you cook when you were, uh, um, I mean, you started at 13. And yeah, but, yeah, but my mother, you know, always cooked. But when we were six, seven, five, six, seven years old, you know, coming back from school, I don't think ever anyone told us to do our homework. That was our business. We had to do homework. And I would never have come back and said, Mom, I'm bored. My father would say, you're what? Bored? <laughs> Come with me. So, you know, we had, a, we had a little bistro. So from feeding the, the chicken to washing the bottle in the cellar to pump mm -hmm. up the wine from the barrel to uh, uh, helping peel potato or clean up stuff, you, we tried to escape. We tried to hide ourselves when we came back from school. <laughs> so there was never any. So, you know, so I wanted that business since I was six, five, six, seven years old. So at 13 years old, I left home to go into formal apprenticeship. Uh, that was 1949, so a long, long time ago. But, uh, 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 you know, I was in that business already. I've been in that all my life. You know, so, yeah. Is that just the way of life growing up in France? I mean, you just like, automatically, you ended up in the kitchen doing at least some sort of yeah. Uh, chore? Yeah, but, you know, uh, it was another world at the time. Remember, there was no television. Mm -hmm. We didn't have any magazine. We had no telephone at the time. Right. We had no ra radio. We had no radio. We had no telephone. And we were very happy. So for a kid, I had blinders on my eyes. Either I do what my father was doing. He was a cabinet maker. I trained all my mothers, one or the other. I never thought that I could be, I don't know, a doctor or something like this. You know, so I went into the kitchen and I never regretted it, but uh, the choice was probably much easier to do than for young people now. It was this or that. Life was simpler, you know. And, uh, and food was a very, very big part of our life. I mean, you know, it's still a big part of my life. Like as I say, going to pick up those little fish uh, along the sea, that's part of my tradition. Sure. In the spring, to go pick up wild dandelion, you know, the wild salad that we pick up. Mm -hmm. I pick up wild carrot. I pick up uh, some little uh, beach plum at the beach. I pick up uh, those rows at the beach to crystallize the petal. You know, we part of uh, part of nature and the same thing with the garden. You know, and that's very very important for the kid. You know, when Claudine was a year old, I hold her in my arm and she stirred the pot. So she, quote, made it. So she was <laughs> going to eat it. Cool. And uh, the same thing with my granddaughter. She came home, she's three years old. She's taller than me now, but at that time she stood on a, on a little stool. And I thought, okay, give me the parsley. No, 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 no. Come with me to the garden. That parsley, test it. No, that shine. Okay, no, that saragon, test it. Then I come back. She sit next to me or stand next to me. Give, me. give me a spoon. Give me that. Help me. Then I take her to the market. I, I want to get some pear. Make sure they are ripe. Smell them. Look at them. The tomato too. Smell them. So she touched the food. She handled the food. She gave it to me. So that become a canvas, you know, in the family that we discuss. And it's not only a question of the cooking, it's a question of the sitting down after and talking when you're sitting down and one conversation leads to another. It's a very important part of a, a functional family, you know, that kind of a two years in this, you know, so, yeah. yes. That's amazing. I think the last time that I saw you uh, in person was, um, I was in uh, Newport, or was it? Yeah, it was in the Rhode Island. At, uh, oh, yeah, 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 right. We, we at the cooking. Food and Wine Festival there, yeah, yes. Right That's right. And I got a, uh, an apron that was signed by you and all the other chefs oh. that were there. Oh, boy. And I've worn it so much uh, that, uh, that you can't even see the names anymore. <laughs> this is gone. Oh. I've, I've, I've washed it and washed it and washed it. It, it just means so, so, so much to me, Chef. Um, just, to see you, you're, uh, when I say icon, you know, it's just the word that gets thrown around. But uh, truly, you embrace everything. Uh, that that means so much to me, and that's why I wanted to ask you about music because I I love music, I love food, I love art. By nowhere near town, I'm, I write, I'll draw stick people. You know, you are like, oh, oh, don't be afraid. Right. You know, just start it and just adjust. Well, you know, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I, I love that simplicity. 
So anybody that's listening can, uh, can, can, get, can get your art as well, too, right? It's uh, Jacques Pepin art if they, if they just... Yes, I, I have a, a, a website. I don't take care of it. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, uh, my, my uh, Facebook. It's Claudine who does it, and Instagram. But uh, I have a friend, uh, Tom Hopkins, who lives with me here. He's my photographer, and he does uh, the taping of my show. And he's done book for me for 38 years now you know, uh, a long, long, long time ago. So uh, he's the one who created the, the art site and mm -hmm. he makes uh, gicle, you know, out of that and he sells them and uh, yeah, so that, that, that's fun. I, I, I never would have, would have done that myself. I never thought that, you know, I would sell art, but he's selling it, <laughs> so that's great. It's the secret to longevity, Chef. You're doing what you love. You can see it in your face you yes. know, you, 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 you can hear it in your voice. You, it, it, it just penetrates your soul. And, gosh, you know, I, I don't want but this you, to be, you know. You know, there, there, are, there are similarity. You know, when you're in the kitchen, of course, when you follow a recipe, it's different. But for a chef who doesn't follow a recipe, what do you do? You taste, you add. You taste, you add. Tablespoon of that, tablespoon of tomato sauce, this of that. You taste, you add. It's very instinctive. It's almost automatic. Uh, you know, it's... Uh, and, and likewise, when you paint, when I paint, you know, it's not like you say, oh, maybe I need a little bit of blue, blue and ego there. And I go to get a tube of blue. No, you can't. You have to have those panning in front of you. And it just feels good. You do a touch of that. You put a touch of that. You adjust. You adjust. You go. So there are those similarities, something very, uh, uh, sometimes irrational, but uh, very instinctive, you know, in the cooking and in the painting process for me. And well, that's, what, that's, what, that, and that's what you do when you're in Florida, I would assume, right? Is that, that's where you, yes. that's your yeah. studio of uh, art? Yeah. No, and while I was supposed to be with you, which I, I forget the hours, I was painting upstairs anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, we started a little late with our podcast today because, uh, yeah. with, oops, a daisy, that happens, yeah. you know, and it doesn't yeah. matter. Just to be able to have this time and, and to share with you is just uh, so precious to me. So what would, what would you consider your favorite holiday to be? I mean, what, 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 do, you, what do you enjoy oh, for, the most? For me, no question, it's Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. Thanksgiving never existed in France. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a holiday which is not some type of a date, date for the military where millions of people were killed uh, for that war or that battle or that thing, or a religious date where uh, for one reason or another, there's no, there is no date of any of this. All there is to be is to be together, to Thank share you. food, wine, and all that. So they is the best for me. So, Jacques, you know, I, you are an inspiration to so many people. Who, who was your mentor? I mean, uh, growing up and going through the, the, uh, the, the learning stage, your formative years as a cuisinier, who did you look up to? Well, uh, my mother, certainly, because as I said, she had a restaurant, uh, and my mother, my aunt, aunt, cousin, all of those women were formidable women, you know, very involved in cooking. So that was the first one. And then after that, of course, when I went into apprenticeship, you know, and uh, when I work in Paris, certainly the chef at the Plaza Athenee and uh, other chefs that I work with, and in this country, Pierre Frenet, you know, was really a, a great friend, but also a mentor, and as well as Craig Leborn in another way, you know. But uh, yes, yes. So people like that, I, I admire, and uh, and that I cook with, and and my friend Jean Claude, you know. So right. in another way, you know, as a as a soulmate. You know, so. Exactly, exactly. And, and where did you learn uh, the, the dexterity, all of the amazing intricate tournée and to flew the mushroom and do, um, all of the, the, uh, the charcuterie and, and all of the type of garmage work that you did? Yeah, but that, that, that was part of the apprenticeship, you know, at mm -hmm. the time. I mean, I did three years of apprenticeship. When I finished apprenticeship, it continued being, you were first commis, second commis, mm -hmm. then I worked in Paris. I was second commie at the Plaza Atene, then first commie. I mean, it took forever and ever. And through all of those years, you repeat and repeat and repeat. You see, the trade was quite different. There was no, uh, there was no glamour, glamorification of the, of the trade. That is, you know, it was, uh, you know, it, it was a, you work in a restaurant, 
and you confine yourself to the style of that restaurant. You were not going to bring yourself into it. This is what we do here. That's what we do at the Plaza Today. And that's, a, that's what I tell you, the young chef to do. You know, you work two, three years with a chef, even if his sense of taste or her sense of taste, uh, sense of aesthetic is not the same than yours, it really doesn't matter. You know, you have to, to, you, you have to confine yourself to try to see through the eye of that chef so you can learn. And then you work with another chef for two years. And again, you, 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 you look at it through her eye or his eye, sense of aesthetic too, and you do that for eight, 10 years. And then after that, then you have absorbed an enormous amount of knowledge. So now you are giving it back through your sense of aesthetic, through your sense of taste. Now you start doing your own stuff, you know, but not at the beginning. So uh, certainly when I was uh, uh, working in France until a few years ago, it was never to, to show your, your knowledge, although it was just to, to confine yourself to the style of the house. That was. So you have to... Uh, to adapt yourself whatever place you work with. Uh, there, there was no dish you went into the kitchen where the people say, make sure they know I'm the one who did it, I signed it and all that. That no. didn't exist, you know. So it, it was less pressure on the chef also. Uh, at the Plaza Athene in Paris, we were 48 chefs in the kitchen. Well, I tell you, one of the f famous dish was the, the lobster Plaza Athene. Probably 48 of us could have done it and you would never have known who has done it. You know, right. and that was the whole idea. Right. And uh, that's how I remember dishes also. Mm -hmm. I, I, will, I will have my eye closed. You give me, I say, that's the lobster of the Plaza Tere. Or oh, that's the striped bass of the pavilion. You know, <laughs> we used to, you remember those stages from those mm -hmm. different places. Or oh, this is the, the chicken and cream sauce of my mother. <laughs> this is it, you know, so. Well, you don't ever forget. That these are quotes from you, basically, but I'm, I'm not actually quoting you, but I know that you, you never forget the flavors of your childhood. I mean, the memories that, that come to you are, are, yeah. are, are so strong. It's like incredible. They're very, very visceral, you know, and uh, they stay with you. Uh, as, as I said, you know, if you see those young uh, soldiers in Afghanistan uh, somewhere in the world they dream of at night, they dream of the clam chowder of his mother, or the, the fried chicken of his father, or the lobster roll of his grandmother. You know, so at that point, the food transcends the level of, uh, uh, you know, of the nourishment, yeah. uh, the physiological function of food. It transcends this. It becomes home. It becomes love. It becomes security. It becomes all of that. This is what food becomes, you know. And Big those hug. are... The, the taste, the taste of your youth, you know. So absolutely, I'm. I'm going to talk. You know, to excuse me. One more thing on there is a Chinese philosopher uh, who said something. I may maybe paraphrasing. Patriotism is the taste of the dishes of your youth, mm -hmm. and there is a great deal of truth there. The yeah. dishes of your youth, you know, this is what patriotism is, you know. So. It's, what, it's yeah. a strong connection. It's 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 it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's unbreakable, really. You know. Yeah, I mean, I, right. I find dessert. If, if you can create a dessert that reminds you of something you had with a kid, you got a success on your hands. Of course, yeah. I mean, it could be anything from a piece of fruit to something as complicated as, you know, a gigantic cake. But, uh, yeah, no, apricot uh, jam. Apricot jam. You just made yeah, some, me. didn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's summer. I, I love that's see in my backyard. I grow a lot of food, and I like to I like to do preserves, etc. So I have apricots in my in my in my refrigerator right now. It's pretty good. Yeah, Gloria, she had a a, a Puerto Rican and Cuban um, uh, set of parents, right? Does, Background, yeah, right. Does that does any of that influence um, and infiltrate into your 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 home? Does, uh, Yes, I mean, she was born in New York, but uh, from a Cuban father, Puerto Rican mother. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's true. Uh, it's interesting, in fact, that you said that because for many people uh, look at me, uh, maybe as a quintessential French chef. Mm -hmm. Now you take uh, one of my books, Essential Pépin, on page 25, you have a black bean soup with sliced banana and cilantro on top. And then on page whatever you have a, a, a you know a southern fried chicken and another one a lobster roll from Connecticut or whatever it is. After over sixty years in this country, I'm probably the quintessential American chef now. You know, more because I never, I don't think I was ever too uh, 
too chauvinistic about where I came from and all that, whatever I like. And I do a fair amount of Japanese and Chinese food, uh, Vietnamese and so forth, uh, except for the technique which I've remained, you know, certain method of doing uh, purely French in a sense. The rest of it, the food that I do now, even years ago, I remember my mother coming, you know, 40 years ago, coming to America, and I would cook, she said, wow, this is not French, that's good, what, what do you do, you know, this is uh, French. I, I, I never tried to be strictly French or whatever, I don't think so. No, I could, I could see that, I never, I never, I mean, your accent is, there's a slight accent, I'm not going to lie, Chef. Yeah, but it's, it's Connecticut Yankee roll. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, you know, I, I could go on forever and ever, but I want to be um, respectful of you and your time. So I just, want to, I just want to say this has been a fascinating interview. To be able to spend time, even if it's virtually, is just is, is such, such, such a pleasure. And I, I just want thank to um, thank everybody that's uh, been listening and for those that are watching. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you yes. as well. And, um, Happy cooking. And just remember, cooking is the art of adjustment. That's a quote from... Yeah, the art, of the, the art of recovery, the art of adjustment, the art of compensation, all of that. You know. God yes. bless you, Chef. God bless you Thank for you. everything you've Happy done. Happy cooking. Happy Thank cooking you to you much. as well. Take care. Take care of yourself. Take Bye. care. Bye. Foreverocean.com.